fact, we've a special program marking the anniversary of the death of the Busby Babes. On the fringe of a Munich airport lies the wreckage of an airliner, still smouldering from a crash in which 21 people were killed. Tragedy enough at any time. But in that plane were a group of young men who were almost the personal friends of millions. Manchester United, the finest soccer team Britain has produced since the war. The awful day of the Munich disaster was something which none of us had ever lived through before. It was like a day that never happened in your head. People was crying on the seats. It was like, it was like somewhat similar to when Princess Diana died. It lasts forever in your mind. It'll always be the same for me. I'll never, never, never really a day goes past then you don't think about it. One form or another. always remember them as they were, young lads, full of fun and great players in a great team. Forty years ago, Manchester United played a European Cup match in Belgrade. They won. Young and confident, everybody loved the Busby Babes. League champions twice, the first team into Europe, they could win the lot. They didn't. On the way home, they stopped at Munich Airport. The plane crashed on takeoff. Eight players died. Their average age was just 23. It was a national disaster. Back in the early 50s, the Babes were just a twinkle in manager Matt Busby's eye. Then, if a big club wanted a new player, they simply bought one and hoped he'd fit in. Now Busby wanted to build a team from scratch, to start a family. His new youth policy began in the back streets. Lads in his own image, lads that were hungry for success. Duncan Edwards loved football. He took the ball to bed. Soon, football would love Duncan Edwards. Near the German goal mouth, left half Duncan Edwards cuts through the defence line like a knife through butter. He beats Vafers and shoots, and it's in the net. A beautiful goal. He was kicking a ball before he could walk. So when he was going out to down to my mum's on a Sunday, he'd be kicking the bricks. I was just say, people are watching you, but he didn't care. He'd keep kicking all the while you went along the road. Couldn't stop it. Oh, that's the way we used to go on with him, you know. <laughs> the clubs, all the clubs were watching him. And he was booked to play for England. He said, well, Mum, he said, uh, I think the best club that I would like to go to in the country is Manchester United. So I said, well, if that's what you want to do and where you want to go, I said, uh, you do it, you go. At 15, Duncan Edwards signed for Matt Busby. Many more followed. Bobby Charlton was part of the most talented youth team ever. Then, Busby threw them into the first team. It was a revolution. He had a purge. He, he would pull out about five recognised players, you know, really famous players, and then he, he, would bang, he banged five youngsters in, which at that time was unheard of. You know, you never played young players then. You know, this is a hard, tough man's game, you know, put young players in amongst all these rough, done, big rough diamonds. A 17-year-old couldn't possibly play football in some of the old fogies' ideas. How could he, you know, that was there. If he wasn't 23 or 25, he couldn't have known anything about football. And, and suddenly, 
the attention of the whole country was on Manchester United. You know, so, and of course the Busby babies, because they're playing babies, you know, they can't possibly win anything. But pff, it exploded and it just went on. Now football is the present game, played in the sun, played in the rain, and the team that gets me excited, Manchester United, Manchester, Manchester United, a bunch of bouncing Busby babes. They deserve to be knighted. If ever they're playing in your town, you must get to that football ground. Take a lesson, come to see. Football taught by Mike Busby in Manchester. Manchester United. A bunch of bouncing Busby babes. They deserve to be knighted. People thought that they were part and parcel of, of that kid that had broken through. There was a wonderful spirit, believe me. There was one, people said it was religious. It was nothing to do with religious at all, honestly. It was a religion, but it was called a Manchester United religion. It's like, you know, when a great painter takes, flicks up some colour from his palette, the amalgam of two or three colours sometimes. There's some accident, some magic in it that happened. There was with that group because you had a terrific balance of Coleman and Edwards. You'd got Byrne and you'd got Bill Folkes at the back. And then right in the middle, you'd got that rock of Mark Jones. Outside left, David Pegg is on the move straight from the restart. Over to Bobby Charlton, who slams it home. Manchester fans are wild with joy, but they've more to come. Raywood takes the goal kick, and now it's Manchester all the way. The ball goes out to the right wing, where Manchester skipper Roger Byrne tries hard to stop. United swing into the attack. Barry beats them all with a brilliant dash. And Taylor finds the net! The impact of the young players was so incredible that striker Tommy Taylor was the only player United bought in four years. But Tommy was a star back at his home club, Barnsley. He got the £15 a week maximum. Why leave? Well, there was lots of speculation about where he was going to go and where he wasn't going to go, and this and other, and there were all reporters hounding him, you know, that, that started coming to my house then, you see. So if they came, he used to rush upstairs and hide in the bedroom because they used to stand there and say, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't know where he is. Well, at the end, they say, well, can we come in and just take one photo of you? Thinking, probably, they'd find him there. So he was hiding upstairs out of way, you see. Oh, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave Barnsley. But uh, it was one of them things, he had to go. It was money, wasn't it? And uh, he had to go. The Barnsley directors had decided to cash in. Matt got his man. The transfer fee was 30,000, but they knocked off a pound to take the pressure off Tommy. The signing was big news. Tommy leaving home was on TV. They sent this telegram to say that they were coming to do a, a program of him at his house, you see. And so I had to go and that, and, and of course, like, you know, and it, it was so funny because um, it was like an Andy Pandy thing because, uh, and here comes his girlfriend and here does this, and they filmed me walking down and then into his house and then we sat on set here and his mum offered us a cuppa, like, and we sat talking and doing it like that. It was, looking back, it was funny, really, you know. Yeah, we come out and we to come out at back, do we? And at the bottom of this yard, there was this big gate. And it was about five or six foot high. And uh, all of a sudden, he set off running and he jumped straight over the top. Well, when it, we opened the gate and went to the other side, and it was cobbled. What well, see, the other side, he could have he broke his neck and he was lying to the gate, all laughing. And I says, if Matt Busby had seen they do that, he'd have come potty like, you know what I mean? Tommy Taylor left one family in Barnsley but found another at United. If anyone was worried about the money, they soon forgot. His goals won the Babes their first championship in 1956. Johnny Berry beats his man, Taylor moves in, and Taylor finds the net! Blackpool defence, trying the offside game. Berry going through with it by himself. Cross it comes and Tom's made a perfect hit. Captain Roger Byrne lifted the trophy. He was old at 27. The others were still too young to vote. Despite their fame, the babes were not rich. They lived at home or in shared houses with a landlady. 
And there was about 12 of us in, in one big, great big old house, and, and we shared it with uh, traveling salesmen and people like that. But it was quite close to the ground, so it was all right. And it, it was good fun because you never got away from talking about football. Bobby was a new boy in the house. His best mates would be David Pegg and Tommy Taylor. The press took photographs of them washing up and with tea towels in their hands and, and that sort of thing. They probably never had a tea towel in their hand in their lives, most of them. We used to go in the pictures. We'd walk, walk into Manchester to the pictures and walk back because it was boring on the bus. You know, let's, let's walk. We used to walk. The first time, uh, Tommy Taylor was a big star, I and mean, David Pegg was in the first team, and I just arrived as a youngster. And they asked me to go, and I thought, well, maybe I, I, I'd, I better behave, I better behave like a real, a real professional footballer. So I said, I'll leave it to me. I'll get the tickets. And I said, where, where are we going to sit? And, and the, both of them said, oh, well, let's sit in the best. So I said, okay. So I said, three bets, and my whole wage packet went in one, at one go, and I, and I thought, blimey. It was the birth of the teenager, and as it happens, there was the phenomenon of instant stardom like a boy could get hold of a guitar in the afternoon by night time it could be a star with somebody looking for his autograph now in the football world we had this amazing team Manchester United and they were a charismatic group of guys and what wasn't obvious at the time but I tipple to it was that they were the first non-musical megastars there was gods. There was gods. There was an hairdresser in Collier's called Harry the Barb, as he called it. And they'd have all these pictures of all the players, and you'd go in and you'd say, uh, Can I have a David Pegg cut? And it was all like sort of going back and everything. Oh, God, it is looks smart. And they'd go out, these fellas would go out in and they'd look like David Pegg. David Pegg was like a film star. We didn't have a lot of money to, to spend on clothes, I must be honest. I think it was the way that I came down. I, I, I tended to buy stuff that would last a long time rather than be absolutely fashionable at the time. But um, Little Eddie Coleman was the, the trendy one, you know. He was the first one I ever saw with drain pipe trousers and winkle picker shoes. I wasn't that daring. I used to have the crepe sole shoes, but not the drain pipe trousers. And, of course, he had the sideburns down here. The real, not the teddy boy image, but he was never a teddy boy, but he was in the image of that. That was the sort of clothes. You wanted to look so smart that, say it was in the taxi, we'd all be sitting on the edge of the seat so that we wouldn't crease our jackets and, and keeping our legs out like that, so we wouldn't, you know, crease them, so that we'd look, you had to look absolutely flawless when you got there because you'd walk in like that. But Eddie had his shuffle like that, you know, he had that little, it was a little shuffle he used to go in. When I first met Eddie, he just asked me if I'd like to dance, and I said, yes. Obviously, I thought he was cute. <laughs> he really chuffed. He said, met this lovely girl, you know. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, oh, what do you do for a living? And he said, oh, I work in Trafford Park. And I thought, oh, very nice, you know. Oh, he'd say he was a painter and decorator. That was his favourite, painter and decorator. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you say he was a docker. <laughs> and we just got sort of friendly, and then I think the week after we went, and he asked me to go out with him. And it went from there. I went out with Eddie for two years. After everything had finished on a Saturday, they'd all sing, even get Eddie to sing sometime, you know. But when he'd had a couple of drinks, he fancied himself as a singer sometimes. I forget the songs you sing, but he fancied himself as a singer, you know. Pennies from Heaven. That was his song, Pennies from Heaven, because he thought he had a great voice. And Bobby would get it, Bobby Charlton would sing in there. And uh, Bobby did actually have a fabulous voice, you know. He sounded a bit like Bing Crosby. Oh, was it Frank Sinatra? <laughs> Sorry, Bobby. We were fun-loving lads. It was just like 
young people growing up together, but in the end, um, we were the Busby Bays, but we didn't feel we were the Busby Bays. We, we, we felt we were a team of lads, a team of pals. Busby had great ambitions for his teenage team. They had won the championship, now he wanted to take them further. The Football League had stopped Chelsea entering the first European Cup. Matt would be more determined. I think that a lot of chairmen, and particularly the management committee, they lived in their own little world. They were Eurosceptics. And I think that uh, they didn't want to be bothered with a lot of foreigners who were, you know, coming over here and trying to be clever. And I think that they, they just did not have the vision to see that it was opening a door, both for showing our lads the technical skills that they needed to know, and also the fact that it could be a marvellous money spinner for the best clubs. It was just a natural progression. We had to go that way. So I never doubted it for a moment, you know, that it was right. And I've never doubted for a moment that, that it was right. But it was because the old man said, that's the way we've got to go. And if we have to argue with our own football authorities to actually make sure that it happens, then so be it. Matt Busby did the unthinkable. He went to war with the Football League and won. The Babes would be the first to play in Europe. I found it a tremendous and exciting prospect. And I felt, as Northerners do, that London were away behind the times that Chelsea had turned down the chance of going into Europe. It took the, a Northern team to have the bravery to do it. I remember everybody was really excited about the fact that they were going to play overseas. Because it was completely strange. There was no television. We didn't, we didn't see Spanish football or French football or German football or whatever. Uh, so the only way you could find out was to play against them. It was just a great adventure. for the first English team in Europe. The idea of flying to Bilbao for a match seemed incredible. It was another world for players and supporters. Spain, all the players, it was foreign. It was like on a different planet. We, we'd never been there. We might have seen them on the pictures, like, you know, where it's always sun shining and people are drinking there and they're lying and swimming in the sea and all that. Well, we couldn't do that. So for Manchester United to go into Europe, it was a wonderful adventure. It was fantastic. It was like the voyage of Sinbad. It was very cool. We were expecting northern Spain to be sunny, but it was in the time when uh, the winter and uh, they, they had snow there. It was all completely different. The way the loudspeakers going with uh, Spanish giving the team information. And then uh, the tom-toms, the drums or the roar was different. A Spanish roar was uh, like it is now, still different than an English roar. When somebody's had a shot, it's a whoosh. Where it was different, there was a roar with us. Everybody roaring, where it was a roar with them. I thought, oh, we're in real trouble because um, they'd scored the fifth goal to make it 5-2. Five, five and then Bill Whelan picked up a ball. And picture it, very heavy, lads struggling to move, getting late in the game, 5-2 down, he unleashed a 20-odd yarder. Flew, flew in the net, a wonder goal. We've got a hell of a chance here, and it lifted everybody's spirits. The story of Manchester United's young heroes battling away in Europe was big news. The papers fueled the public's imagination. These newspapers must have made a fortune in them days because they'd be buying every newspaper, not one. They'd buy all the lot to read about how Manchester United was running Europe. And there was nothing nasty. There was nothing like you read today, this fella's knocking about with the Spice Woman and this fella's going with the River Dancer Woman and all this. There was none of that. 
The worst thing that they ever did was Duncan Edwards bought this bike, a rally bike it was, and he went in without lights and he got fined 10 shilling and Busby fined him two weeks' wages because he'd taken the name of Manchester United into a court. In your dreams, you joined United at 15 as an apprentice, got in the first team at 16 and played for England at 18. It came true for Duncan Edwards. Duncan, first of all, he was a star who didn't act like a star. He act like just one of us. We became internationals, we became stars. Bobby Charlton, the world famous star, and he will tell you he couldn't match the great Duncan Edwards. He's fast, strong, tough, pass the ball, brave, head the ball, you know, and, and, and head really decisive goals, you know. Lived, lived the game, you know. And he, he, would, he would break teams. He could break teams himself individually. If we one goal down, he'd say, well, don't worry, Walter, at half-time. He said, Walter, don't worry, I'll, I'll get a goal for you in the second half. You know, he had this confidence in himself and in the team. Brian Douglas pulls a smart one back to Duncan Edwards, who bangs it home. With only seven minutes to go, Edwards got the ball, saw his chance and whammed it home from 25 yards up. So England won 2-1. He used to run out like and he'd jump and start doing this try uh, imagine uh, jump into head an imaginary ball that wasn't there but it was fantastic and he'd be running on the spot and he'd do these exercises he was the first man that ever did that the rest of them used to just run out as though he'd just come out of a, a pub or something and then he'd roll his sleeves up push his sleeves up and then he'd uh, turn his top of his shorts right down like that as he could uh, have his thighs Free, you know, because he could kick well. So look at him. <laughs> In the 50s, even Duncan Edwards had to do national service. He played for the Army and United. They released him to play in the return game in Manchester against Bilbao. Bobby was not so lucky. One of my sergeant majors asked me if I was going to the match. I said, I'm not going to the I'm doing national service. And he said, oh, I'd love to go to the game, you know. The game, this was the, the Bilbao game, and I said, well, I'd love to go as well, you know, but I'm stuck here. And he says, if I, if I can arrange it, he says, he says, can we go? So, ooh, I said, yeah, I said, I can get tickets. I'll get the tickets. So uh, we went up to see the Bilbao match, which is, anybody at that particular time will remember, was an unbelievable experience. I was at Main Road that night, and I remember it, and it was the most pulsating, tense occasion that I have ever been in. I've had four children. And my wife's insisted at everyone that I had to be there at a bedside. <laughs> it wasn't my choice, I can tell you. And that night at Main Road was so similar to that night when my four children was all born. That's how pulsating it was. Floodlights at Main Road, Manchester. Having lost 3-5 in Bilbao, United must beat their opponents by three clear goals to reach the semi-finals of the European Cup. I remember thinking, oh, this is... This is paradise, you know. But I was so in involved in trying to get the three goals like everybody else. And it, I mean, it was deafening. Four minutes before half-time, Manchester's Violet goes through and it's a goal! The cheering was unbelievable. And the way the team played, oh, it was fantastic. Tommy Taylor, that was Tommy Taylor's finest night. I'm telling you, it was Tommy Taylor's finest night. And they all admitted that if they wanted a breather, they booted up to poor old Tommy. Taylor gets Carmelo a bump, but Atletico de Bilbao are renowned as a cracked Spanish 11, and we were glad we weren't defending the Manchester goal. Manchester second came from a free kick, Taylor doing the rest. And Tommy Taylor made the goal for the last one, and he got the third goal. And you, everybody was jumping and crying and grabbing each other and hugging each other. And you lived on that for months. It kept you buzzing. You didn't need the, a drug like they have to. They need cocaine and all that today. That was the drug for you. That was the drug. Seeing a wonderful team of these young lads all coming together and playing a wonderful game. So simple. Bill Bow was the night of nights for the Busby Babes. But in the semi-final, they narrowly lost to Real Madrid. Playing abroad had been wonderful, a great success. 
everybody enjoyed it, Matt, the players and the supporters. No one doubted that next year they could go all the way. But safety in the air was beyond their control. Back in Bilbao, there had been an omen of the disaster to come. The match itself was played in a snowstorm on a very uh, muddy surface, you know, with, 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 with snow that tended to thaw straight away. And when we came to take off, the aircraft was covered in ice, the snow, and uh, the pilot wouldn't take off until we had swept the wings. They were given sweeping brushes to, uh, to sweep the wings and, and uh, help sweep the ice and snow off the runway. We knew that we had to be back because the league would have been down on the club and, and on the players. You know, we don't know whether they'd have been suspended, fined or what for not getting back to fulfil the fixtures. It was treated as a big joke, you know, everybody was laughing and smiling, let's say, oh, all right, skipper, and all that kind of thing. We were up. I was on the top of the thing, brushing it with Eddie and Bob um, Duncan, and we were, you know, we, we actually cleared the, uh, the, all the snow and ice off the, off the wings. We didn't think anything of it at the time, but I think it was exactly a year before the Munich crash. Nearly sure it was. And that's where the photograph comes from, of all the players with the sweeping brushes. Europe was not all glamour. Manchester United had to fly to Belgrade in their second season abroad, a difficult place to get to in 1958. The club had to charter a plane and still stop halfway in Munich to refuel. Yugoslavia was seen as a hostile communist country. The Busby Babes were now part of the Cold War. I thought it was very cruel places, very secretive places. It was going to a place where a big iron door would close as they went through. And th that was it. Until they come back out, the iron door would open again and they'd come back out. The night, the last time I saw Eddie, and he kept saying to me, I wished I didn't have to go. And I said, I can't believe it. You've got this fabulous job. You can go all over the place. And he said, Marge, I don't want to go. My bag was packed. It was in the... I was just waiting, to, waiting for the taxi to come. And Jimmy Murphy pulled me to one side. And he says, Ronnie, the boss has just rung through. Roger Byrne's been hurt. And he wants Jeff to go in your place. Jeff, Jeff Bent. He came back and said, I'm going to Belgrade tomorrow. Couldn't get over it. I, I was so shocked, you know. He said, I don't have to go. He said, uh, the boss said that um, if you can't manage, you know, I don't have to go. It was a bit irate actually <laughs> and Jimmy says well look, calm down it's only a trip out and Jimmy tried to calm me down a bit and I said oh well I'll see the boss when I come back and see about my future he said you won't be able to manage on your own with Karen and I said I will be able to manage he said you go and enjoy yourself and I know looking back it's the first time he'd ever been like that because he just didn't want to go. Not there, behind the Iron Curtain. All the North's top football writers joined the players on their flight into the unknown. Families and landladies made sure they were well prepared. I don't know, we assumed that they didn't eat in the, in the Eastern Bloc, so we, we took hundreds of, hundreds of bags of sweets and chocolates. I, I remember one, one player actually was frightened to death that he was going to be hungry, he took a stove. He actually took a little miniature gas stove so that he could, he could cook something. <laughs> and when we got there, the food was perfectly adequate. The match in Yugoslavia was a sellout. United had won the first game in Manchester 2-1. They needed at least a draw. Belgrade fancied their chances. So did the Babes. 
The tension was unbelievable. We knew what we were facing, we were a great side. But we just turned it off. We just went out, went at them. We attacked them, you know. And they, I think we surprised them. United started as if they wanted to get home quick. The young players put on a virtuoso performance. At half time, they were 3 0 up. In the second half, the game changed dramatically. Now it was the referee's turn in the spotlight. Manchester had done an hertere middle gegriffen, um überhaupt unverständlicherweise, denn sie haben wir 3-0 geführt. We'd had a few bad referees, but this one was outrageous, I thought. You know, I thought Harry Gregg was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> Some of the decisions to, to this day, Billy Fox was a uh, penalty kick given against Billy Fox when the guy pulled him down. Wo sie die Engländer Manchester protestiert haben, aber es war bei Gott ein einwandfrei Elfmeter, den man gehen muss und sonst ist man kein Schiedsrichter. Wenn es einer ist, dann ist einer und fertig. Belgrade's dramatic comeback would end at 3-3. It didn't matter. United were through. The British press criticised the ref. It didn't matter. Nothing about the match would matter. Enjoyed the party, enjoyed the banquet. The lads were lads. They had a drink. Been up all night whether you drunk or not. We got to the airport the following morning with the sore heads and tired heads, and that includes the pressmen. They all sore heads as well. <laughs> Everybody on the aircraft in a real happy mood going back to play Wolves. At Belgrade Airport, 44 people got on the plane carrying the Manchester United party home. Half of them would never get there. The boys played cards, cracked jokes, slept off their hangovers. Bosby and his trainers wondered about the game with Wolves, while the pressmen swapped stories and angled for scoops. Halfway home, the plane touched down at Munich Airport to refuel. It would never fly again. Everyone got off. Time for a quick cup of coffee. And the terminal did what anybody was buy a present for family relation, whatever. And sometime later, five, ten minutes, called back and board the aircraft. Anyway, we were watching out the window and we didn't get off and the brakes went on and we shuddered to a stop. And we turned round and went back up the runway. I didn't think anything of it at all. It took a little bit more interest because the snow was getting deeper. Down the runway again. The same situation. Time for takeoff and we hadn't got off. We apologised and they said this time they'd go back to the terminal and we'd disembark. There'd been chat among the lads that we'll come back by the hook of Holland and we'll have a game of cars and a few bevies. On the runway, the crew could find nothing wrong with the plane they decided to have another try. Back with the players was Vera Lukic, the wife of a Yugoslav diplomat in Britain. United let her join the flight at Belgrade so that she and her baby daughter Vesna could join her husband. Now she was having second thoughts. I was and then I to go to taxi, to Meni je prišao Frank Taylor i rekao mi Lukić, a vi on je popravljen, mi idemo za Manchester, mi sutra imamo utakmicu. Every time I get on an aircraft I feel the same, you know, the pilot must be sure that it's okay, and if he's not, well he's dead and I'm dead. So by the time I got my coffee, he said, you know, we're going, we back to, back to the aircraft as quickly as possible. So, the cold feeling, I really did. There were frightened people on the aircraft. Everybody changed seats. David Pegg left us. Billy went that side. Dennis and Bobby come from down here, up there. And then little Johnny Berry spoke, and somebody laughed or coughed, and he said, we're all going to get freaking killed here. Billy just went across to me, and he says, uh, Albert, this is death. I'm ready for it. 
We went down the runway, and I quite—I thought we were airborne, actually. But then we began to have these impacts. Terrific bounce in the aircraft. You went seemed to go up, you know, terrific. Because by the time it looked like that and seeing the end of the runway, I thought, Christ, we're not going to make it. Smashed the fence, turn, turned around, hit the fuel dump, split the plane in half. Tearing, ripping, thumping and banging. I remember looking at, seeing the, the, the end of the aircraft off and snow, you know, and I, and I thought, what a silly bloody way to die. And I did honestly think I was dead because you grow up in one thing or another, hellfire and damnation. And I thought, I'm in hell. Captain Kane come around my side of the cockpit and shout it run, you stupid. It's going to blow up. So I ran, you see. And um, of course it was snowing. And I realized I'd no shoes on my feet. The people running shouted it again, run, and I shouted, come back, there's people alive in here. And they didn't. And then I turned around, you know, and then I could see ev everything. I was frightened of what I'd find. And I found a suit first, and there was nothing in it, which was a relief in the darkness. And then eventually, under a lot of rubbish, I found a baby. And uh, I crawled out and started to run with it. And then I saw Harry Gregg come round the back of the plane, holding uh, something in his arms, and it was obviously a baby. It was start I didn't know there was a baby on board. When he came back to pick me up, he realized that my mom was in the wreckage too. So he uh, came back again and picked up my mom this time. Here is the news. So far, we know there are 23 survivors after Manchester United's air crash at Munich this afternoon. The aircraft was returning from Belgrade, where Manchester United had entered the semi-final of the European Cup. It had reached Munich and was just taking off for home in poor weather when the crash came at three o'clock. A young boy came up and he said, um, oh, there's been a plane crash and uh, United's planes crashed and they're all dead. And I said, don't be sick. I thought that was a sick, he was just being, telling a joke or something, trying to make fun. And I said, don't be silly. And he said, no, it's true. I said, don't, I don't believe you. We just, we turned on the radio to see what, what if it was on the radio. And then realized the radio just said that there'd been a plane crash. Crowds of people were at the news agents, grabbing newspapers. People had assumed up till that point the crash wasn't that serious, that even though someone had been killed, perhaps it's the older people or the crew, not young, fit footballers, that it, they wouldn't be dead. And, but they was. We didn't sort of have any final number until actually it was about six o'clock in the, in the, on Friday morning until a policeman came to the house and told us that David was dead. David Pegg, just 22, had died along with 24-year-old Mark Jones. Captain Roger Byrne, 28. Jeff Bent, 25. Dublin's Bill Whelan, 22. Tommy Taylor, 26, and Eddie Coleman, only 21.
The next day, Harry Gregg and Bill Fuchs went to see the injured in hospital. We went to the uh, hospital and I remember seeing Frank Taylor and he was in good form considering he had, he had his leg up here and his arm up here and he was all over, you know, he was in a mess. And uh, then I saw Duncan Edwards and I asked the doctor how was Duncan, you know. He said, oh, 50-50, 50-50. Now, I just remember hearing this boy shout to Jimmy Murphy, Jimmy, what time's the kickoff against Wolves on Saturday? I've got to play in that match. And when Jimmy came over to speak to me, I said, that's a big fella, how is he? Oh, he said, you know, Duncan, he said his old set, he was raring to go. And I accepted that. The frage was immer sofort nach den Kameraden. Das war die erste Frage. Nicht, es tut mir da weh oder es tut mir da weh, sondern wo, wo sind die anderen? Und das finde ich eine sehr gute Gemeinschaft eigentlich, muss unter ihnen gewesen sein. It was terrible. Asked the doctor, where's the rest? He said, this is it. This is it. I said, aren't they at the other hospital? He said, there's no other hospital. He said, this is what, you know. Then I really, it was, then it really hit me. With Duncan Edwards still fighting for life in Munich, Bill and Harry returned to a hero's welcome. In our family, he's, uh, he has always been treated as a hero. Uh, if it hadn't been for Harry Gregg, there wouldn't have been a family at all. Life's not about heroes. You help where you can. Sometimes you wish you had bloody help and you didn't do it, and you can't make those decisions. In Manchester, the atmosphere was near hysteria. The question was no longer who had died, but why. I was very, very angry about it. I couldn't understand why they were allowed to get on that plane after trying twice to take off. I mean, they were all grown men, they could all speak up, and nobody said anything. I am saying now, if anyone had had the courage to stand up and say, here, this is crazy. Wouldn't have happened. But like all people, we're afraid to lose face in front of our friends. It takes a very brave man to be a coward. Matt Busby was badly injured. He recovered, but he could not forgive himself for taking the boys into Europe. He was really upset. And he was on the phone, and he spoke to each and every, every one of us. And when he spoke to me, he said, I'm so sorry, Marjorie. I'm so sorry. And he felt as if it was his fault. He said he blamed himself. He should have said something. But he said, how would I have felt if that captain would have been telling me how to, uh, to tell my lads how to play football? He said, and that's how I would have felt telling him how to fly his plane. The man everyone looked to for answers now returned. The co-pilot, Ken Raymond, had died, but the pilot survived. Captain Jim Thane found the finger of blame pointing at him. He was the scapegoat because people wouldn't listen to the truth, so to speak. I think this is what it boiled down to. And I suppose you have to have, a, have to blame somebody if you've had something go wrong. And he was the obvious person. I suppose he made the big mistake in being alive. An investigation took place several hours after the crash. It rushed to the judgment that ice on the wings had been the cause, the British pilot's fault. Captain Thane said there was no ice and that slush on the runway was the reason, the airport's fault. His view is now confirmed by one of the first witnesses on the scene. Uh, as I Captain Raymond befreien wollte, was von innen ja nicht ging, musste ich nach oben auf die Maschine. Ich hatte Gummistiefel an, es gab Schneeregen und ich musste mich auf dem Flieger, Tragfläche und Rumpf, musste ich mich bewegen. Wäre die Maschine vereist gewesen, wäre ich niemals da hochgekommen. Ich hätte mit meinen Gummistiefeln keinen Halt gefunden, ich wäre sofort wieder runtergefallen. Die Maschine, der Rumpf und die Fläche waren nass, aber kein Eis. A lot of people don't really understand that it wasn't the ice on the wings. I think very few people really 
appreciated that he wasn't to blame and that it was the slush that caused the accident. The city that had cheered their young stars off now cried as they came back in coffins. I remember when they, they brought the, the bodies home, Wilf took me down to the airport and we watched them bring in, which seems a bit morbid, but you just felt you had to be there. And um, we watched them bring in the bodies off, which then you realized they were dead. And there wasn't a sound except the wheels on the road. That's all you could hear, and people crying, grown men crying. And that night, I was inside the ground. There's a small gymnasium inside, and they turned that into a chapel of rest. And uh, after everyone had gone and left us, locked us inside, this other constable looked at me, and there was tears in his eyes. And all night long, people were coming to the door, you know, outside, laying flowers and crying and praying. And it was a long, long night. And, you know, I could smell the, the varnish on these coffins. And it's with me today. Whenever, whenever I, I smell new varnish, I think of these coffins in that gymnasium. And seeing them there with tears in my eyes. And when morning came, it couldn't come quick enough. And I could go home and just try to forget it. But I never have. The funeral was, it was like, oh, it was unreal. There was thousands and thousands of people on each side of the road, you know, standing there in respect. That really blew my mind. It, it was so awesome. I was a pallbearer at Eddie's funeral, and uh, it was my birthday as I walked in. His mother said, Happy birthday. When Eddie left, to go on the, um, the Munich to Munich. He bent down to kiss his mum goodbye, and he said, I'm going now, Lizzie. And he bent down, and she said, oh, don't kiss me, Edward. She said, uh, I've got a cold. And it, she never forgave herself. She said to me, I never even kissed my son goodbye. We were chatting about Eddie, and she said, you know, he used to say, you're the worst mother in the world. You're a terrible mother, she said. And he said that because I wouldn't let him have a bike. She said, no one let him have a bite because I was frightened of him getting hurt or killed on the road. And she said, um, you know, I, I wish you now that I'd let him have the bike. Ten or twelve days later. And this morning, I couldn't find the papers. I looked everywhere, that's strange, this. Where's the papers gone to? And I kept asking for them and went and looking below cushions and things like that. There, what you do in your own home? I couldn't find them. Then I found out why. And that's when it sunk in. Duncan had died. You felt he was the essence, the heart of the whole thing, really. He was, in a way, symbolic of everything that United stood for. And he was a world-class player. He was one of the great players of the world. I never said uh, how good he was, nothing, nor the dad. We never said nothing to him like that. We wouldn't, no. Never told him that. Yeah. I never told him that I loved him. But I did. I thought there was nobody like him in the world. I'll tell you that. Yeah. But I never told him. Sometimes I wished I had, you know. Yeah. He was really a lovely, lovely, uh, lovely lover. He was a lovely lad. People say that you should forget that like, 40 years ago, but I can remember it was only like 40 minutes ago. And it was a part of your life that had finished forever. And you'll take that to your grave with you. I, I know I will. 
and there's thousands more like me. The most important thing about the Busby Babes, the Red Devils, you call them what you want. They say they would have been the greatest team in the world. Maybe. They say they might have been the greatest team in the world, maybe. But the one thing very sure, they were the most loved team.